All right, first of all, let me say good morning to uh, my church family and friends. Our lesson this morning is going to be taken from the fifth chapter of Hebrews, verse 14 on discernment. I want to thank little Alex for reading that particular verse. I'm going to be using the King James version of that same verse. So uh, I'm going to be using some of the words that is mentioned in the King James version. Uh, you know, in the in the game of golf, there are there are markers that uh, at the starting point of each hole. Now, anyone can hit from these markers, regardless of whatever your skill level is. Uh, we have the training markers, which is really close to the hole that you are hitting to, and some yards behind the training markers. Then we have the women's or the ladies' markers, and then then a little farther back from the ladies' markers. Somewhat uh, a few yards back, we have the men markers. It's a little further back than the women's markers. But with the men's markers, there are three to four different markers for the men. It depending on which golf course you go to, but most of them are three different markers on the men's markers. They are the beginners. Then they have the intermediate. And then they have the advanced markers. These markers are way back there. They're the farthest markers back from the hole. Now, this advanced markers, they're for the big hitters. They're for those that have practiced and have good techniques and hitting skills. They have developed good habits. They know how to correct their mistakes. They have studied the game and they know how to approach the ball. They are pretty skilled in what they do. They practice a lot and they create really good habits. And we call this marker, the big boys marker, marker because those that hit from this marker, they are well equipped. Now in the, the Hebrew writer said, strong meat belong to those that are full age. Basically what he's saying, or in other words, what he's saying, strong meat is for the big boys. It's for the mature. Those that have learned how to rightly divide what is being said. Those that have learned how to properly apply the word to their lives. Those that have committed their lives to Christ. Those that, have, those that are willing to make sacrifices for Christ. Those that practice what they preach or teach. Those that have created good spiritual habits in their Christian journey. Discernment, Hebrews 5, 14, God says, but strong meat belong to them that are of full age. Even those who by reasons of have their senses exercise to discern both good and evil. Discernment means to see and identify by noting differences. We must be able to see, we must be able to understand and identify by noting differences. What are some? We must be able to see and identify good from evil. We must be able to distinguish between what's right and what's wrong. And then we must be able to distinguish truth from error. Now we're not talking about choosing between the pleasant and unpleasant, but we're talking about rather between good and the bad. Because I think we all understand and we all agree and we all know that some things can be pleasant, but it might be bad. And what may be unpleasant can be good. One example in the Bible, when the Bible talks about discipline, I think it talks about discipline when it's being administered. Uh, it's not good at that time. Nobody's jumping up in joy because they are being disciplined at that time. But further down, it says it can be good. You can be grateful and appreciative of the discipline that you had. Another example is something that I think a lot of us, uh, I know I did, and some of us have grown up with. Remember the medicine castor oil? 
We was brought up on that as children. You know, every ailment that you got, it looked like your parents always went for that castrol. I remember getting sick and boy, I tell you, I saw my mom getting the, 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 the spoon and bringing out that castrol and I said, mom, no, 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 I feel a lot better now. That casserole is some of the unpleasant, nasty tasting medicine that I have ever had. I could not stand casserole. But you know, they, they, they tell me that it's good. Uh, you know, I couldn't quite tell because uh, when that casserole was brought out, I felt better and I hadn't even taken it. I'll tell my mom, hey, I feel better now. I don't need that casserole. But they said casserole was good for us, even though it was unpleasant. Now, we're not talking about something that is, uh, uh, pleases us. But choosing that which is best for us and others, choosing what is best for the church, choosing what is best for the gospel. Sometimes we might wonder, why is it necessary that we might be tried by fire? By reason of use means or practice or habit. God said, but strong meat belong to them that are of full age. Even those who by reasons of, what we mean there is by practice, 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 where it becomes such, it becomes a habit, it becomes natural. And because we practice and it becomes a habit, the writer says it exercises our senses. And we all know that when we exercise, we are exercising for improvement, improvement of our body or improvement of a part of our body to strengthen that body. And so the author is saying, that's what we're doing. And so we're able to, or we have the power to, to, to discern, we are able to discern between good and evil. Now we're told that if we practice a long time with the right standards, it helps us to affect the right discernment. It is said that our mental ability or our mental power at first we process on simple truths and these simple truths become a practice or habit. And by doing this, we increase our power later to understand the higher and the more difficult truths. It appears that the Christian, the Hebrew Christians made themselves open to criticism of still being spiritual infants in need of milk rather than strong meat because they fail to bring out their power, their ability to grow with practice or habit. And what we need to do is just develop the type of habits or weigh in matters, weigh in decision, weigh in situations. There's an old saying that says, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. You know, we can avoid much trouble can be prevented through foresighted discernment. Great men have blundered, according to the Bible, for faulty discernment. Great men are not always wise. Job 32, 9 says, neither do the age understand judgment. Now these men, they were great in spite of their mistakes. But to the extent they falter in discernment, they decrease their greatness. Three points of discernment we'd like to briefly speak on in this lesson. Good and evil. We want to speak of some, look at some biblical failures in discernment. And then we want to look at some guideposts or some guidelines to wise discernment. Let's look at good and evil in Hebrews 5.14. You know, a large number, if not a majority in our society today are against any attempt to classify good and evil as taught in Hebrews 5.14. To them, nearly all moral practices 
are good. And almost all religious teachings are right. To them, the right or wrong of an act or teaching is not in the deed or the precept, but rather in the mind of the participant or the instructor. So this, so thus, what may be right for one may be wrong for another and vice versa. According to them, every person is a God unto himself. Now we know if this was true, no man could ever choose evil, provided he thought he was choosing good. And no way would seem it right could ever be wrong. The Bible says there is a way which seemeth right unto a man. But the end thereof are the ways of death, Proverbs 14, 12. So some ways are good, we know that. And some ways are bad, we understand that. And we can understand that the bad ways has its penalties. So when we look at it, we say, in spite of how inviting it seems to the traveler, switching and perverting the road signs will not make a bad road good. It won't make a good road bad. But what it will do is bring grief. It will bring regret. It will bring woe upon the door. God says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. That put darkness for light and light for darkness. That put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Isaiah 5 and 30. The right or wrong of a thing is not just a matter of our personal thinking. Truth and right are facts rather than some abstract idea. So what we have to do is maintain our minds to fit what is true and what is right, rather than changing our minds to fit those ideals. I think perhaps the greatest sin of the ages is man, his, his fruitful, his pointless attempt to change right to fit himself rather than change himself to fit right. Biblical failures in discernment. We have the young prophet deceived by a liar in 1 King 13, the 13th chapter. In that particular chapter, he is called a man of God. Uh, we see that he had courage. We see that he cried out against King Jeroboam adultery. He wasn't fearing his own life. But we also, also see that God had commanded him to neither eat nor drink, nor return the same way in verse 9. And we also see that he obeyed to a point. But he let an old prophet lie to him. It cost a young prophet his life. What was his downfall? His downfall was he failed in his discernment. He believed a lie. How about the rich man who was called a fool in Luke 12, 16 to 21? Interesting about the rich man. He was smart enough to make money. But he wasn't smart enough to discern material and spiritual values. He was a fool because he left God out of his life. And he thought his soul could live on the things stored in the born. His tragedy was one of discernment. How about this one? Some tricky Pharisees who tried to trap Jesus over in Matthews 22, 15 to 22, because they could not comprehend, they could not understand two loyalties, an earthly and a heavenly loyalty. 
this shows there is a place for both alliance. How about Martha and Luke 10, 38 to 42? She had a choice between two important things, preparing a meal or listening to Jesus. Martha chose a lesser important activity. Her sister Mary chose to sit at Jesus' feet and heard to hear his word. But Jesus told Martha, Mary had chosen that good poet which shall not be taken away from her. This is a good one. The uplift society. They sought to stone a poor woman over in John 8, 3 to 11. Their self-righteous and ever-ready condemners of others brought to Jesus a woman caught in adultery. And then they had the nerves to remind Jesus that the law of Moses demanded stoning and pressed him for his verdict in the case. But we see that Jesus discerned the matter properly by showing less concern for the woman's past and for the future. Jesus says, I do not condemn thee. Go and sin no more. How about some guideposts, some guidelines to wise discernment? Faith. We see that Over in Hebrews 11 to 25, we said, by faith, Moses, when he was older, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh, the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Hebrews 11, 24, 25. How about hope? Hope was another power which influenced Moses in his choice. Hebrews 11, 26. He valued disgrace for Christ above the treasures of Egypt. For he was looking ahead to his reward. And how about love? Jesus said, if a man loves me, he would keep my words. John 14, 23. The Bible speaks of love, lovers of pleasures more than the lovers of God in 2 Timothy 3 and 4. And Paul said that those who love not the truth will not find the truth, but they will rather, but rather will be possessed with a delusion which will cause them to believe a lie and be damned. 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 through 12. How about courage? Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul in Matthews 10, 28. Fear has often got in the way of wise judgment. Fear of financial losses, fear of job losses, fear of promotion losses, fear of prestige losses, fear of public favor losses. Fear of persecution and fear of ridicule. Fear of life. King Saul explained his great disobedience with one word, fear. 1 Samuel 15, 24. I feared the people and obeyed their voice. How about examples of Jesus in Isaiah 715, it was prophesied of Christ that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. He is the only man who ever perfectly discerned every problem and every issue of life. He was tempted, he was hounded, he was tested, he was tried, persecuted, and crucified. So if we follow the principle Christ laid down, we shall be wise discerners. Sincerity, rather than deceit, love freely of hypocrisy. This will enable us to make a better decision than if we are moved by deceit. I got this particular verse, uh, this particular verse, I got it from listening to Carlos Osorio lesson 
on Wednesday and also Anthony John's lesson. They use this verse and I, I, I really liked it and I threw it in on my lesson. It says, Leviticus 19 and 18, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against any of your people, but love your neighbors as yourself. Leviticus 19 and 18. This will free us of retaliation, vengeance, and many other woes which cloud our judgment. Of course, we have caution. First Corinthians 16 and 13 says, watch ye. That's a phrase of caution. Proverbs 22, 3 says, a, a prudent man, a cautious man, one that shows good and careful judgment when he's handling practical matters, he foreseeth the evil and he hideth it himself. But the simple pass on and are punished. What looks good may not be good. Solomon said that which appears to be sweet bread may be gravel, according to Proverbs 20 and 17. Investigation. Never reach a decision of consequences without fully investigating. We should be sure we have the facts before condemning others or before plotting a course of our, for ourselves. We must deal with knowledge instead of the presumption, gospel, or rumors. You know, people have accepted doctrine without searching the scriptures. The Bible says over in Proverbs 13, 16, Every prudent man dealeth with knowledge. And we see that the Bereans acted with prudence. They searched the scriptures daily to see what they were hearing was true. Acts 17 and 13. Principles. Very interesting. Principles, rather than abusing of principles, we sometimes start out fighting the abuse of a principle. And then we end up fighting the principle. We end up throwing out the baby with the wash. Every good thing has its dangers, even the pulpit. It is the Christian duty to discern good and evil. Throw out the evil and retain the good. Much trouble has arisen in the church because of poor discernment. As I conclude this morning, I'd like to just give you an example of abusing a principle and how we end up fighting and fighting the principle and throwing out the baby with the wash. You know, the Bible instructs us with many scriptures, principles, that we ought to give Christ our best, we'll put Christ first in our life. This is a principle that many religious groups teach, including the Church of Christ. You know, I was raised up in the Baptist Church in Oklahoma. And this was a principle that was taught to the extent that we had what we call our church clothes. You wore them only when you were going to church. You didn't wear them to school or anywhere else. If you went to church that morning when you came home, from church, you took them off. When and if you went back to church that evening, you will put them back on. This was our practice, our habit of giving God our best. You didn't wear your school clothes or everyday clothes to church. That was a big no-no. That wasn't our best. That wasn't considered our best. And this is one of our ways of giving our best to God. And we use Bible principles for this practice. But then we started fighting this principle of dress. It doesn't matter how you are dressed good. God looks at the heart, not outside of man. It's what's on the inside of man that counts. So what happened is that we end up throwing out any principles on dress. Our members start coming to service wearing inappropriate clothing. So we started out 
fighting the abuse of the principle and we ended up fighting the principle. The principle of giving God our best. We threw out the baby with the wash. One of the daily and most urgent problems of the Christian is discernment. We must be able to identify by noting those differences. If there is anyone who's not a member of the church, not a member of God's kingdom, God tells us how to become a member. John 5, 24. Truly, truly, I tell you, whosoever hears my word and believe him, who sent me has eternal life and will not come under judgment. Indeed, he has crossed over from death to life. We need to hear that. We need to believe in Hebrews 11 and 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who approaches him must believe that he is, that he exists, and that he rewards those that earnestly seek him. We must repent of our sins, Luke 13 and three. No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you too will perish. We need to confess, Acts 8, 37, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Then we have to be baptized, Acts 2, 38. Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The lesson is yours. Thank you.